You know, I always say if you if if you take a piece of paper and just draw a straight line, and and the left side of the line is when you were born, and the right side is now, right? Mm-hmm. And then just start plotting um, the, the 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 highlights, right, or the the moments you can remember. And the highs are above the line, and the lows are below the line. Okay, our lines are all going to look like a sine wave, a series of ups and downs. And we all know, based on everything that we've learned experientially and everything we've learned in the best literature out there, is that we learn more from our lows oftentimes than we do our highs. And so, and so, the idea is perform performing optimally, performing the best you can, even in those lows, is going to teach you something, and probably teach you a lot more than those highs. It's nothing wrong with the highs. We have to enjoy them. We have to learn from them. We have to absorb them. But but honor those lows, honor those antagonists and, and work through them and under, and recognize that 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 those moments where we are going step by step matter. And um, and we're learning and we're growing from that from it. And and we should pat ourselves on the back. We should not you know, we should not uh, feel bad about, oh, I wasn't at my peak. OK, who cares? You did the best you could, you know, and right. and not only be be good with that, but pat yourself on the back for that, because because that's what you see when you see people struggling and they make it through, um, whether it's in the gym, whether it's on the battlefield. But really, I mean, the the person struggled through cancer and made it, the, you know, friends of mine who've been injured, you know, uh, you know, horrifically in the war and they've had to work their way back, you know, and they would tell me, hey, Rich, at those in some of those moments, I was living minute for minute, you know, mm-hmm. and that's really beautiful because they learned and they struggled. That's where the struggle is. Welcome to Black Belt Beauty Radio, a podcast fueled by a passion to support your journey in developing your most beautiful and optimal performance in life. Each episode is driven with the intention to elevate your mind. When we elevate our mind, we elevate our life. So get ready. It's time to rise. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Black Belt Beauty Radio. I am so excited about this one. This week's guest is remarkable former Navy SEAL commander and one of my most favorite authors, Rich Devinney. With 20 plus years of experience as a SEALs officer and current senior facilitator at Chapman and Company Leadership Institute, Rich has an expansive array of knowledge when it comes to the attributes that accelerate optimal performance in life. His book, The Attributes, 25 Hidden Drivers of Optimal Performance, dives into the arena of what contributes to optimal performance and how to develop these driving attributes in your life. In this epic episode, we discuss peak performance versus optimal performance. You know, I love that how your self-identity shapes your reality, the difference between an attribute and a skill, attributes that create a great leader, distinguishing mindset factors that lead to success during moments of uncertainty, reframing the lens of what if to be less fearful to one that is more open to expansive possibilities, using the power of emotions to your advantage, identifying your own areas of strengths and weaknesses to increase growth and performance and so much more. So Rich's work speaks straight to my heart, you guys, and integrates so powerfully into my driving mission in life, which is to help you optimize your life performance and to live from your fullest potential. This epic conversation will guide you in exploring yourself with ultimate curiosity to cultivate a deeper sense of awareness and leadership. I cannot put enough emphasis on this next statement right now. Go get his book, The Attributes, 25 Hidden Drivers of Optimal Performance. I love it. It is one of my absolute favorites. It will live in my library forever. He's got some awesome workbooks now out there that will support you to develop these attributes as well. You can take his attribute test to see where your range is in these specific attributes via his website. And all of this is in the show notes for you. So Take this episode in. Let us know what you think. Please share it to your IG stories. Tag Rich and I. His handle is at Rich underscore Divini. Again, in the show notes. The conversation always continues on Instagram. So definitely DM us if you have any questions. Leave us comments. Anything you feel you want to expand on from this incredible episode. You guys, it is an honor to share Rich Divini with all of you. So enjoy. 
You guys, before I hit play on this episode, I got to fill you in on one of my secret weapons that helps me to feel great and perform great in my life. I get asked this question all the time. How do you have so much energy? And the truth is, it's my entire lifestyle. But a major factor that plays into this energy is my morning ritual. That's right. That is my secret weapon. It's how I'm starting my days. How you start your day, you guys directly impacts how you are going to move throughout your day. So what I wanted to do to really support you to optimize your energy, to help you be very focused and drive yourself in the direction you want to move yourself throughout your day is I created a free downloadable 10 minute kick-ass energy morning ritual. That's right. Cause I know, I know not everybody has a ton of time every morning to designate to a morning practice, but even 10 minutes 10 minutes at the start of your day will make a major difference. I say it all the time, you guys, inches make the mile. So what do you get in this morning ritual? You get a five minute meditation that you can actually take in at any time of day. It's going to root you, center you, and help you just get very grounded and elevated within yourself. You're also going to get a free downloadable PDF with some action prompts just to help you build the habit of this ritual. So so there's some journal prompts in there. There's a movement prompt in there. There's some intentional nutrition prompts in there just to help you, you know, be very conscious about the way that you're driving your body and your nutrition throughout the day. Both are huge levers in how you're going to feel and perform. Another call to actions. All of this you can receive by entering your email. There's a link in the show notes, but this is also on blackbeltbeauty.com's homepage. I just made it easy for you by putting this link in the show notes. Put in your email and you will immediately get the meditation and PDF sent to you. I did this because I want you to feel great and perform great in your life. And honestly, you guys, my morning ritual is truly that. It is a secret weapon. It's how I sharpen my sword and how I strengthen my shield and prepare for battle. Whatever life's going to throw at me or whatever I'm, you know, putting myself in, in terms of being in the arena, you know, seek the fight every day. I know that I'm going to be better capable after I have done this morning ritual. So, check it out. Let me know if it serves you. DM me on Roxy Look or Black Belt Beauty's Instagram. I can't wait to hear what you think and what you feel after practicing this morning ritual. We're on. Rich, you look you look like you're at the beach right now. It looks nice and bright and totally my kind of vibe. How are you today? <laughs> oh, great. I'm at the East Coast Beach. I'm in Virginia. So, uh, but it's a beautiful day. I mean, spring's finally here, so we're we're uh. we're happy. That's the best feeling. I know that feeling after living in New York for so many years, that long winter. And then when you start to get the warmth, it's like a whole new, it's just the best feeling ever. So, yeah. Yeah. Makes you appreciate it. So totally. Well, listen, I am so excited. I kind of, you know, I just dosed you a little bit with this. So I first discovered you on an incredible podcast with Tom Bilyeu, Impact Theory. And, uh, you know, the whole interview is so excellent. There was one aspect that just hooked me and I was like, holy shit. And I'm going to start there. And it was this optimal performance piece. So optimal, optimal performance is built into my brand. Literally in the intro, you know, you hear me talk about the content here on this podcast is meant to serve an individual to live their most beautiful and optimal performance in life. So hearing you talk about the difference between peak performance, because my brand is a holistic, high performance lifestyle brand. So, you know, we definitely want to hit these high moments of performance, but to hear you differentiate peak performance and optimal performance was so powerful for me. Um, I would love for you, if you don't mind just starting there, explaining that difference yeah, absolutely. The um, and you know, it's it's something that occurred to me, especially as I got out and I was talking about high performing teams, and and a lot of people would ask me about peak performance because peak performance is a is the thing now. I mean, everybody's trying to to reach it and maintain it and do as much of it as possible. Um, and ultimately, I want to kind of tell everybody there's nothing wrong with peak performance. The what we have to recognize, however, is that peak is an apex. 
um, and and at a tape and an apex you can only come down from right so um, peak off it also often has to be prepared for and planned for and scheduled right so the the pro athlete uh, say the football player for example ha- you know spends his entire week planning and prepping so that he may peak for three hours on Sunday and and it can be done in any sport I mean because that's the whole point of sports is to peak while you're playing uh, it can be done in business it can be anywhere I mean you can you can plan to peak for a sales presentation you want to give or a presentation. Um, the problem with focusing only on peak is it it misses everything else. And that's what optimal performance is about. Optimal performance is about everything else, okay? Because optimal performance, and this is really where I kind of describe SEALs as and spec operators as, is that, you know, it's how can I do the very best that I can right now in the moment, whatever the best might look like. Um, sometimes it looks like peak. It's flow states and everything's clicking and 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 it's cool. But sometimes it's like it's it's bad, it's gritty, it's dirty, it's hard. And and all I have in my in my tank is I can just take step, I can just take one step at a time. And I I thought about myself in SEAL training or certain combat situations where there was nothing peak about my performance. And then you think about mm-hmm. Uh, people struggling with with disease or cancer or struggling through hard times like a divorce or or any hard thing they're doing and they're, they they there's nothing peak about their there's there's like no I'm not a peak I'm just I'm taking it day by day or moment by moment this is us by the way in COVID you know 2020 when COVID hit and we're suddenly in quarantine very few of us got up that morning that first morning in quarantine and would have described our performance as peak right, right. Um, <laughs> we we were doing the best we could and yeah. um, and so I think optimal performance allows a a very responsible and healthy modulation uh, that that does a couple of things it it tells us when we can go at what level, right? I don't need to be peak while I'm driving to the grocery store, okay? Mm-hmm. So I can I can I can modulate my performance so that I'm recovering in the moments I can recover and then and then maximizing my peak when I have to peak, right? Because because yeah. if you're trying to peak all the time, when you actually have to peak, you're probably going to be worn out and not be able to peak the the way you're supposed to. So so it allows you to modulate and plan a little bit better. And then in the moments you need to peak, peak on demand, you know, and that's really the the key. Oh, it's so good. I love it because to me, it's like, it's more sustainable. There's more longevity. I mean, you know, my whole thing is I'm here to live from my fullest potential in life. That's what I'm here to coach my girls, my community. That's all the content in this podcast. It's, it's not just for these. Yes. You want these incredible moments, but how do you, how do you create a life where you have lots of incredible moments and, Mm -hmm. you know, it's an interesting, I I just, I want to insert this um, because I've been so curious uh, to what you would think about this. But when I think about optimal performance too, thinking about it from the perspective of, of being a woman, this is really uh, interesting. Like, cause you know, females hormones are changing every Mm -hmm. week. Right. And so some days, and I talk about this a lot, you guys, some days to my girls, literally whether it's in the gym or it's mental work, you know, my capacity at certain points of the month, it's just not the same as other points. Right. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean I'm not getting up and giving it my best. And it doesn't mean that I'm not even kicking ass in that, that, you know, specific moment. It's just that that ass kicking could look and feel a little different than other points, but it's all about like where you're coming from. Right. In, 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 in in your efforts. And that's where the optimal piece really is, um, you know, just stands out to me rather than just like, every day trying to, you know, hit 150. And then if you don't, then there's disappointment, then there's letdown and all that. So, well, in some ways you're, you're actually kicking ass even more when you're performing at those lows. I mean, because you're, you're, because you're doing things that you never thought you could do. And you know, life is a sine wave. You know, I always say, if you, if, if you take a piece of paper and just draw a straight line and, and the left side of the line is when you were born and the right side is now. Right. Mm -hmm. And then just start plotting um, the, 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 the highlights, right. Or the, the moments you can remember and the highs are above the line and the lows are below the line. Okay. Our lines are all going to look like a sine wave, a series of ups and downs. And we all know based on everything that we've learned experientially and everything we've learned in the best literature out there is that we learn more from our lows oftentimes than we do our highs. And so, and so the idea is perform, performing optimally, performing the best you can, even in those lows is going to teach you something and probably teach you a lot more than those highs. It's nothing wrong with the highs. We have to enjoy them. We have to learn from them. We have to absorb them. But but honor those lows. Honor those antagonists and, and work through them and under and recognize that 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 those moments where we are 
going step by step matter. And um, and we're learning and we're growing from that from it. And and we should pat ourselves on the back. We should not, you know, we should not uh, feel bad about oh, I wasn't at my peak. Okay, who cares? You did the best you could, you know. And right. and not only be be good with that, but pat yourself on the back for that because because that's what you see when you see people struggling and they make it through. Um, whether it's in the gym, whether it's on the battlefield, but really, I mean, the the person struggled through cancer and made it. The, you know, friends of mine who've been injured, you know, uh, you know, horrifically in the war, and they've had to work their way back, you know, and they would tell me, "Hey, Rich, at those in some of those moments, I was living minute for minute, you know, mm-hmm. and that's really beautiful because they learned and they struggled. That's where the struggle is." Yeah, gosh, when you when you say the word struggle, I'm thinking about an attribute that I'm so excited to talk about, um, perseverance, but I'm not going to touch that yet. I think it's so <laughs> it's I'm so excited about this because, you know, for so many reasons, um your book is incredible. You know, oh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I cannot, this will be, I already know, and it already is one of the greatest books that I will be gifting to individuals because this is also where we, we really connect. Um, you know, I, my coaching, I I was just mentioning to you, it's a lot of inside out tools, right? It's like top down stuff. right? Right. And essentially it's really understanding who you are. So like going back to what you just said about these kind of low moments, I always say like, you don't really know who the fuck you are until you get punched in the face. And I don't mean that literally, unless you're a fighter and there's a lot of fighters in my world. Right. Um, but I mean, just like punched by life and like you right. really discover a lot about yourself. Now, when I say yourself now, because of your book, I'm thinking about attributes too. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so, and this is important information because yeah. I believe that the more that you understand and you get clear on who you are, you also get clear on who it is that you want to further become in life, right? And I also have this belief that our self-identity really shapes our reality. So if Mm. you don't have a real good understanding of yourself, your core attributes, your core values and things of this nature, then it's hard to really, uh, you know, decide who it is that you want to become. And then that roadmap isn't really there, right? So- Let's go into attributes. One thing that I want to, um, you know, that I think would be great to start this part of the conversation is, can you differentiate the, the the difference between attributes and skills? I think it's a really powerful point of of difference for people to understand. Yeah, absolutely. The, and it really, the epiphany came when I was uh, running my you know, a version of SEAL training. It was a it was training. It was assessment, selection, and training for one of our specialized SEAL commands. So it wasn't the basic underwater demolition SEAL training down in San Diego. It was a different command. And at this command, we were bringing in um, already experienced spec operators. You know, so these are these are guys who already had five to ten years experience as special operators, and running them through our process. And it was, it, and we were getting about a fifty percent attrition rate, which is okay. That's what any process you're supposed to get some attrition. The problem was we weren't able to effectively describe it. We were, we were. We were saying things like, well, the guy couldn't make it because he couldn't shoot very well. It couldn't do this very well. And and what I and it was very dissatisfying for us uh, because these were these were guys who'd done all of this before. So to say they couldn't do it very well didn't make sense. And it was really extraordinarily dissatisfying for them because they're like, what the hell? I, I've been doing this. Right. So so we were coming up short on explanation. It's kind of when I had to go back to basic SEAL training and ask myself, OK, what what are we really doing when we're going through basic SEAL training, which is, again, for, the, for your audience, basic underwater demolition slash SEAL training, BUDS for short, down there in San Diego, six-month-long course, some of the toughest training in the world. And I remember, you know, you spend hundreds of hours in, in SEAL training running around with heavy boats on your head and, and exercising with 300-pound telephone poles and running around with those things and freezing in the surf zone. And all I could think is I I was in a position, I've done hundreds of combat missions overseas. I've done thousands of training evolutions. Never on one did I carry a boat on my head or a 300-pound telephone pole on my shoulder, right? So the question is, what were they doing during that? You know, they weren't training us in the skills to be Navy SEALs in those moments. That what they were doing, they were putting us in environments that were teasing out these innate qualities, these attributes, to see if we had what it took so to do the job. Not if we had the skills to do the job, if we had what it took to do the job. And so, so I knew there had to be a distinction there. And then, of course, I got out of the Navy and 
kept on getting um, questions from businesses. Hey, we're putting together these high performing teams, you know, the best, this person, the best, this person, and we're putting them all together. And everything's going great for, for a little while. But when things go south and sideways, when the shit hits the fan, the mm-hmm. team is turning toxic. And they're like, what's going on? I was like, well, you're, you're basing your, you're picking your team based on the wrong things. You're picking based on skills. Skills are not inherent to our nature. Okay. They, they, we don't want, none of us are born with the ability to ride a bike or shoot a gun or throw a ball. Um, they teach us, they tell us what to do in certain situations, in known situations. Here's how and when to ride a bike. Here's how and when to shoot a gun. Here's how and when to throw a ball. And because they're specific and they're visible, they're very easy to assess, measure, and test. You can see how well anybody does any one of those things. The problem with them is they don't tell us how we're going to show up when the environment becomes deeply uncertain and challenging and stressful because it's very difficult, if not impossible, to apply a known skill to an unknown environment, right? right? In the unknown environments, in uncertainty, we lean on our attributes. Attributes, on the other hand, are more innate, okay? All of us are actually born with levels of patience, situational awareness, adaptability, resiliency, okay? Certainly, they, it develops over time and environment, but you can see levels of this stuff in small kids. Anybody who's had, who has kids will say, well, that one-year-old is a patient kid, mm-hmm. <laughs> just naturally, and there's there's one-year-olds who are not patient, you know? Um, yeah. So you see it, you see this, the levels in small children. So they're innate, okay? They're inherent. They also don't tell us, they don't direct our behavior. They they actually inform how we're going to show up. So our levels of, or I say my son's levels of resilience and perseverance informed the way he showed up when he was learning how to ride a bike, learning the skill of how to ride a bike. And he was falling off a dozen times doing so. All right, so they inform our behavior. And then finally, because they're hidden in the background, they're very difficult to assess, measure, and test. You can, they really show up. So you can't sit, for example, in an interview process for a, for a new hire. I can't mm-hmm. sit across the table from someone in an interview process and tell how adaptable they are or how resilient they are, okay? Um, they are the most visible and visceral during times of challenge, uncertainty, and stress, which made, made the environment, the laboratory that I had in the SEALs, such a great environment yeah. to see this stuff because SEAL training, regardless of what kind of SEAL training, whether it's basic or advanced, it's always about stress, challenge, and uncertainty, yeah. right? So you can see this stuff pretty, pretty visibly. Why it matters for us is because, like you alluded to, we have to understand that the the so first, all of us have all of the attributes. Okay, the difference in each one of us are the levels to which we have each. So, um, for example, adaptability. If if level ten is high and one's low, I might be a level eight on adaptability, which means when the environment changes around me outside of my control, mm-hmm. it's fairly easy for me to go with the flow to adjust. Yeah. Right? There's some, someone else might be a level three, which means when the environment changes around them outside their control, it's pretty difficult. It's hard for them to change. It's difficult. It's painful. It's, it's a tough process. No judgment on where we fall mm-hmm. on these attributes, it's like judging our hair color. There's nothing we can do right. about it. Okay, it's useless. <laughs> but knowing that, you know, knowing that that track, and so I always kind of talk about the attributes as a line of dimmer switches, and okay. each switch is at a different level. And so every one of our lines are going to be different. What we have to recognize is that we're all human. Okay, mm-hmm. which is something we all have to remember, especially today. <laughs> okay, yeah. we're all human. But we're but we're we're like vehicles. We're like cars. Okay, some of us are Jeeps, some of us are Ferraris, some of us are SUVs. All right. Again, no judgment because the Jeep can do things the Ferrari can't do, and the Ferrari can do things the Jeep can't do. However, it would behoove us to lift our hoods and figure out what we are, what engine we have, because because this is where we can actually execute and start realizing our potential. Um, we may be a Jeep trying to run on a Ferrari track or a Ferrari trying to run on a Jeep track. And again, nothing wrong with that either. You can choose to do that. But if you know that you're a Jeep running on a Ferrari track, then it can better serve you in the way you can modify and train and get yourself running better on that track. It shows you where your, where your highs and lows are. And so, and so understanding our engine is really step number one, like you said, mm-hmm. uh, to effectively exploring our potential. Because potential, by definition, is always in front of us, right? It's it's right. always potential is what could be. It's not what it is. Mm-hmm. And so the only way we can explore it is to step out into discomfort to our edges. Like it's kind of like looking at the horizon. I'm going to move to that horizon, mm-hmm. and that's cool because once you get there, guess what shows up? The next horizon, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. So potential is always out there. And I think as humans, our process, the most powerful thing we can do is to continue to explore our edges and move. And that's how we grow because that's that radius just keeps on getting bigger and bigger. And I think attributes, understanding that about ourselves is one of the first steps. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I so agree with all that. I love it so much. I always talk about, you say edges, I say ledges. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And I have this creed under my brand. um, It's, it's called, it's seek the fight. 
And it essentially means like, you know, you got to move towards the fights in your life. You got to move because usually on the other side of the fight is, you know, something that you desire to experience, to attain all of that. And it's in that fight that you are, you know, learning about yourself, that you're developing yourself. And, you know, one of like the people uh, often come to me, you know, to talk about self-confidence, self-trust, mm-hmm. and I got to pick your brain on that stuff um, for that reason, because a lot of people tune in for, you know, how do we develop more self-confidence? How do we develop more self-trust? And I'll just touch on that answer from my perspective, but then, you know, um, you know, uh, pass the mic to you for that. But I can't, you know, in my own life, the way that I have developed self-confidence is by doing hard shit and by mm-hmm. witnessing yeah. myself do the hard shit. And, you know, having this sort of what I frame as like this, uh, the heart of an underdog and the mindset of a champion. It's like, yeah, I'm going to get punched. Life is going to put me on my knees, uh, but I'm always getting back up and I'm always finding ways to get better in the getting back up part. Right. Right. And, you know, so a couple of things that come to my mind, uh, you know, are like resilience, um, you know, courage and these attributes that you so beautifully talk about I say talk because as I feel that you're such a great writer, I can hear you talking to me in your writing in the book, you know, diving into these specific attributes, I think uh, are so valuable for individuals to really understand, like, what does it even mean to be resilient? What is, Mm -hmm. what is courage really? I mean, we know it on a surface level, but to go deeper into, you know, these attributes, the way that you, you know, explain them in your book, I think is so helpful to, getting in the arena and doing the hard shit to cultivate the self-confidence and self-trust, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me, um, let me take a moment to highlight your brilliance. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, because, yeah. because seek the fight is, is actually a brilliant thing to think. And, and, and the reason is actually not necessarily phys- philosophical, but neurological. Um, and the, uh, and it's because when we, when we start uh, experiencing fear. Okay. Our amygdala starts to kick in. Um, we are, are, you know, our, our physiology, our brains start to, uh, present to us two choices, either fight or flight. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we've heard the freeze. We've heard fight, uh, uh, fight, flight, or freeze. Right. But Mm -hmm. freeze is actually, there's no freeze is really just an oscillation. There's no neurological kind of circuit for freeze. It's really an oscillation. It's a kind of a decision between the two, right? So it's either fight or flight. There's, there's separate circuits in the brain for each decision, okay? When we decide to fight, which is, again, it's not just, it's not to say put up your dukes, right, and, and then yeah. throw a punch. When we decide to step into our fear, right, a, a circuit in our brain switches. It's, you know, my buddy Andrew Huberman calls it the, the card circuit. Okay, when that when that circuit flips, we get a dopamine reward. Now, mm-hmm. every, most people know what dopamine is, right? It's, mm-hmm. the, it's the, the, the neurotransmitter that tells us, hey, this, is, this feels great, keep doing it. It's actually the, the core of most addictive behaviors, right? Because, you know, yeah. you get dopamine. But we get a dopamine hit for stepping into our fear, okay? Now, this doesn't mean we're stepping into our fear and everything's done, right? We're, we're, mm-hmm. we're reaching the accomplishment. Every time we step, we get a dopamine hit. And this is by evolutionary design. We are designed as humans to seek, to explore, to discover. So, so the, so nature needed to find a way to encourage us to keep on moving. Right. And so they, so it set up this, this reward system to encourage us to keep on stepping in. So, so when you seek the fight, you're literally setting up a reward system. Okay. And when we decide to step into our fear, we're rewarded. And uh, now th- again, let's not, um, we would not devalue flee because sometimes the right call is to run away. <laughs> okay. Right. But, um, but the idea is uh, that that was much more um, kind of evolutionarily designed for survival, for for threat to life. A lot of times in today's modern society, we fear things that really we shouldn't or we're imagining or present more than they do. Right. Mm-hmm. And so so we just have to start thinking about fear differently. It's definitely good because it allows us to assess risk. You know, yeah. I, you, you know, I say beware the fearless leader that's dangerous. That person yeah. will get you killed. So don't mm-hmm. we don't want to be fearless. But what we do want to do, what we do want to uh, ex- explore is why are we afraid and can we actually step into this? Because if we do, if we decide to, it will feel great. And that's really very rewarding. 
Yeah. Oh my gosh. I so agree. And I love that you have, you know, you and Andrew work together and there's so much of that, uh, you know, neuroscience, neurobiology in the book too. I, it's one of my favorite subjects. I mean, how do you not, when you're thinking about human potential, you cannot ignore that subject. So I love that there's so much integration in that subject into the book. Um, one thing that I have to tell you is that I, I did the incredible tests, the assessment oh, tests. Oh, good. Yeah. So, and I thought it could be fun to just kind of read you my scores and then, you know, that can kind of bridge us into some of the sections of attributes that okay. you share in the book. So, and it was so interesting. So, so in grit, courage was medium. Um, I'll just leave the numbers out and just say medium. Yeah, yeah. Which is interesting, but I totally, but I'll leave the comments for after. Perseverance was medium. That was fucking surprising for me. I'm like, I feel like I'm persevering every day, but okay. Um, adaptability was high. Resilience was high. Not a shocker. Mental acuity, I aced this. Highs on situational awareness, compartmentalization, task switching, and learnability. Drive, that was one of my favorites to go through. Self-efficacy was high. Discipline was high. Open-mindedness, medium. Cunning medium, or cunning was high. Narcissism was medium. And I can't wait to touch on that one with you because people <laughs> probably are like, narcissism, that's an attribute. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, first, and, and, and the, uh, obviously this will be in the show notes, but I cannot suggest everybody who listens to this and watches this podcast to go do these assessment tests they are so valuable. And I know, and you can speak on this, you know, it's like a broad, it's not like, Oh, that's, that's it. You know, the, it's not a, uh, you know, a, how do I a say defin- it? It's not definitive. Thank yeah. You. Yeah, 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 exactly. But it yeah. gives you a good, you know, like when I think about courage medium, yeah, because here's the thing, I'm not the person who wants to jump out of the fucking plane, like right. not you in the dark <laughs> like, <laughs> night, night diving, like, no, you know, but I am the, you know, the woman that will go out and surf the, I lived in Hawaii, Hawaiian waves or, or launch my business and do things that, you know, from a mental aspect, like position me where I'm not, I'm very introverted. I prefer mm. to kind of, I'm not the girl who's like, Hey, everybody look at me. Right, um, right. You know, so even launching my podcast three and a half years ago, like that was a push on me, but I'm like, my mission was so strong that I, I pushed forward. So there's courage in that, but, yeah. um, yeah, well, and I mean, courage, you, by the way, courage is completely subjective, right? I mean, it's sure. like, and, and what's interesting about courage is that, is that what makes us afraid is high, is entirely subjective. The responses inside our physiology are all, are all common, right? And so in other words, you know, people are like, oh, you, you know, you know, sometimes I had someone say to me once, they said, um, you know, I'm so nervous. I don't like public speaking. You know, I'm so nervous to get in front of this crowd. But I, but why am I telling you that you're in, you're a Navy SEAL, right? You've been in combat. And what I said to them is like, listen, don't, don't downplay, okay? Because the because the the same level of stress I might have gotten in a gunfight overseas mm-hmm. could be the exact same level of stress, if not less, than what you're feeling when you step onto that stage. Because physiologically, there's no difference whether you're a kid in a spelling bee pitcher in the World Series or a Navy SEAL in combat, right? So so courage becomes subjective, which is fascinating, um, but also speaks to why this assessment tool. Um, is really designed to be to to have the user be introspective, which I'm so glad you did. So obviously, I'd I'd, I'd um, recommend someone read the book first and then take the assessment. You don't have have to. You don't have to. Um, you can take it whenever you want. But the, but by reading the book, what it'll allow you to do is it'll allow you to enter into that assessment with a little bit more background on what each attribute is. And really? the book, I think you'll agree, the book allows you to do a little bit of introspection anyway while you're reading it because mm-hmm. what you want to do when you take the assessment is really think about the questions and 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 put them in inside your own context and then realize which again you also did when you get those scores those scores are it's a snapshot it's a comparison to a bunch of data that we got so in other words your scores on all those attributes are in compare are compared to this group of a thousand plus people that we had uh, which means you take that and you say okay does this score make sense to me you know mm-hmm. And 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 further introspect. And so so some of the people who've gotten back to me said, hey, I love this assessment tool because it's allowed me to think about things in ways I haven't thought about. Right. So instead of getting focused on the score, they're actually thinking about themselves in different ways. And that's really the real win, which is cool. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, because some of the questions, it's, I mean, the whole process of the assessment test is really, it, it helps you to just think and then to you know, I mean, and this is another gift of your book. It's it's really helping an individual understand themselves more. 
And like I said, at the top of the conversation, it's like, I feel that the more that we get a grip and we understand ourselves, you know, it's like, it's at that quote, you know, anything that could be measured can be improved. Mm -hmm. If you don't have an understanding of, and, 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 and this is such a, a you know, um, a compliment to your writing again, because you do this beautiful job of like storytelling and then explaining things. So it's very entertaining, but so educational at the same time and allows space for the individual reading to go into self and to kind of think about like, huh, resilience or, you know, I mean, the mental acuity was really interesting because mm-hmm. I don't think uh, the majority of individuals are thinking about task switching or compartmentalization, <laughs> right. you know, but yeah. this is really valuable information, you know, to yeah. attain. And then also, you know, to think about, well, how can I, you know, if I'm here to live from my fullest potential, how do I take that compartmentalization attribute and up level it, you know? Yeah, it, totally. Yeah. Well, yeah. if I were to, it's interesting because the, the, the categories, I didn't have the categories when I started writing the book. Um, mm-hmm. I just had this, I had just the attributes. And then as I started writing, I realized that they were binning into these, into these kind of clumps. They were clumping pretty, pretty nicely. And that excited me because it's like, man, man, these are getting, I'm, I'm actually able to explain them. Ultimately, if I were to put the attributes in order, mental acuity ones would probably come first because nothing, everything starts there. Everything starts in our, in our nervous system, our brain. So our levels of, of grit uh, and all of our, uh, our levels of adaptability and courage, it all starts with how we process information, which is where the mental acuity attributes uh, lie. But, um, but the, but the clumps began to uh, really allow some clarity and, Mm -hmm. and say, okay, in this category that we often think of as humans, you know, what are the attributes that that uh, that exist? And so, um, and so, I'll just go through the categories. So, yeah. so, people, so, so grit. You know, every uh, most people have thought about grit, me included, for a little while. That grit was a, was an attribute in of itself. And mm-hmm. and and as I thought about it, I was like, this doesn't make sense. And then, of course, a few years ago, Angela Duckworth came out with a great book called Grit, and she says mm-hmm. basically the same thing. It's a bunch of things, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so. And so, um, so grit really speaks to um, our ability, the attributes and the attributes that contribute to grit speak to our ability to, to persevere, to punch through, to move through challenges. And they're more, cons- it's more concerned with kind of shorter term stuff, mm-hmm. right? It's not, it's not necessarily longer term. When we start getting longer term stuff, we get into drive, right? right? So grit speaks to this, this kind of power through, burst through, persevere, kind of short term. Then you get into the mental acuity ones. Mental acuity is really how our brain processes the world, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, let me, and so, so the, so the grit ones are courage, adaptability, perseverance, and resilience. Those are the four. Mm-hmm. Um, mental acuity is, okay, how are we taking information, taking in information, right? Situational awareness from that information. How are we, uh, assessing it, prioritizing it and focusing that's compartmentalization, mm-hmm. um, inside of our, our activity, how are we swapping tasks and contexts and categories and either was moving from one focus point to another that's task switching mm-hmm. um and then and then inside of all of that how rapidly are we absorbing those those lessons so the things that we're seeing that's learnability so those four start to speak to how we process the world and how and how different uh people in different walks of life can process things faster than others or process things slower but and both have advantages right so yeah. um so that's what mental acuity speaks to. And then, of course, you get into the drive. Drive is really concerned with the longer term goals. OK, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to set a goal that's going to take a while to achieve. And what are those attributes that speak to our ability to kind of do that and move to and move towards a, to, to accomplishment? That's the drive one. Um, and those are uh, self-efficacy, uh, discipline, open mindedness, cunning and narcissism, which we can get into. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then finally, there's leadership um, attributes. So what are the attributes that make up? great leaders. Again, as from a leadership aspect, I say, you know, um, we, we often conflate being in charge with being a leader. They're not the same thing. Okay. Mm-hmm. One's a noun and one's a verb. Leadership is a behavior and you don't get to call yourself a leader. Okay. That's like calling yourself good looking or funny. Mm-hmm. Other people decide that, right? Um, other people decide whether or not you are someone they want to follow, which then mm-hmm. makes you a leader. That's done based on the way you behave. And these are the attributes that contribute to that, which are empathy, selflessness, authenticity, um, decisiveness, and accountability. Uh, and then the same thing with team ability, your ability to effectively operate in a team with other people. You don't get to call yourself a great teammate. <laughs> other yeah. people do. And the behaviors that allow others to designate you that um, are come from the attributes of integrity, 
conscientiousness, humility, and humor. And so, and then I, there's like some other ones we can get into too that didn't yeah. really bend neatly into those categories. And we can talk about those later if we want to. Yeah, for sure. Which were so interesting. I mean, when you think about all these bins, these are all ingredients to kick ass in life, like to understand, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like truly, yeah. like, when, when you're talking about mental acuity, all of, you know, the, the attributes, there's one person that comes to my mind, this will make you laugh. Um, but it's always somebody that I've admired, Jason Bourne. Because like, <laughs> like yeah. this is a bad motherfucker. Like he's in a room, he knows every emergency exit. Like the, you know, the way that they film it, they're showing his brain yeah. compartmentalization, learnability, task switching, yeah. all the things. And so that's stuff I've always, had. I grew up with three brothers. Um, I have a sister too. And so I've always admired that kind of brain that could, you know, that has that capacity and can move through life like that. So, yeah. You know, but did I know that it was compartmentalization task, which no, but now I do. And that's, yeah. you know, it's so. Well, awesome. what it's interesting also is because the, so the high level, so Jason Bourne is the, the Hollywood version, right. Of what, of how that manifests in real life. Right. I mean, yeah. and, and what I found in my community of SEALs is most of us were pretty high on those levels of mm -hmm. mental acuity because we had to really process things fast. However, you look at other communities and, and the ability to kind of, process things fast and and move fast and and swap thing and and, and kind of sw switch focus that doesn't that doesn't make sense like you know i talked to huberman and he's really good at deep focus which, which is what a scientist has to be you know my wife she's she's someone who can who can um when she when she focuses on something i mean she is just a monster i mean she mm -hmm. just gets things done like no other i mean she's brilliant at it she's really good at that you know um and so and so those so again, the, what someone has to recognize is where they fall out is not, there's no judgment on that. It's really, right. it helps you start to understand, in fact, in what environments you're the most strong. And that's really very powerful. Yeah, it's so powerful. I mean, okay, so Drive, the, the other, this is like a lifelong hero of mine. I, I'm thinking of Rocky. <laughs> Just like, like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, that perseverance. And I love how you break it down to like tenacity. You talk about, because all of these, again, are so important. I mean, each attribute is, it's it's like its own book in a way, you know? I know, yeah. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's, it's so pretty it's, dense, I realize. <laughs> it is, but, the, and again, like, but you, you, breathe, you move through it all in such a way where you can really absorb each attribute, think about it, and then decide how it is. Well, actually, this bridges the question, how does an individual, and it might not be a fast, easy answer because all of them are so different, but let me, let me ask you this question first. Can you train attributes? Right, right. I wouldn't say train. I would say okay. because I think train, train I reserve for skill uh, okay. because train often means repetition and, and like, and there's a, there's a certainty to training that has to exist so that you may train. Okay. Um, what I say is you can develop an attribute, but developing an attribute is different than training a skill. First of all, so quick back of the envelope test to okay. to tell whether or not it's an attribute or a skill because they get conflated all the time is to ask yourself, um, can I teach it or can it be taught? If the mm -hmm. answer is yes, it's likely a skill. If the answer is no, it's likely an attribute. The example would be, Roxy, if you said, hey, Rich, I want to go to the range and learn how to hit a, you know, shoot a gun and hit a bullseye every time. I say, fine, I could take you to the range. I could teach you how to do that in two hours, right? That's a skill. Mm -hmm. But if you said, hey, Rich, I want to actually learn how to be more adaptable or more patient, I can't teach you how to do that, right? I can't sit down and teach you. So developing an attribute is, it takes self-motivation, self-direction, and then it takes a willingness for you or that person to step into discomfort and uncertainty so they may test that attribute. So if you're, if you are impatient and want to develop your patient, patience, you may, you must go seek environments that test your patience. All right. Yeah. So stand in the long line at the, pick the longest line of the grocery store and stand in that, or yeah. go pick the, pick the, you know, go driving when you know it's rush hour in the yeah, traffic or whatever that. it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah so, the 405 uh, midday. <laughs> the 405 <laughs> midday. Right. Or any time of the day, actually right. nowadays. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so you have to, so it takes a, it takes a deliberacy. It takes a self effort. And, um, and I would also offer, and I, I could be wrong in this. I would, I, I hope that I am, but I haven't seen this happen is I'm not sure if you can achieve unconscious competence in an attribute there that you're low on. In other words, mm -hmm. you're, you can do it without thinking about it. I think you could, you can achieve conscious competence, which is I can do it, but I have to think about it while I'm doing it. Um, and it's just because it's not, we're moving against something that's natural for us. Right. So in other words, someone who's naturally impatient mm -hmm. may 
have kids and develop patience with their children, okay? That may not translate to other people's children. <laughs> right. Okay? Right. And it may not translate to sitting in traffic or whatever it is, right? So so sometimes these are so subjective that they're contextual as well. Sure. Um, so the key is figure out if you are deficient on attribute, because you don't have to develop the ones you're deficient. It really depends on what you need in, yeah. in, the, in the track you're on. But if you do want to develop one, figure out where and how and what context you want to develop it in. And then you just have to you have to seek the you have to seek the fight, seek right? The fight. Like you say. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies, I am so excited to let you know that Queendom, Black Belt Beauty's exclusive membership community for women only, has officially opened her doors and is welcoming new members. Queendom is an exclusive community of high-minded, empowering, supportive, badass women who are all on a mission to live from their fullest potential in life. This empowered space is monitored by me personally to ensure that it is non-toxic, non-competing, and an inspiring, energetic environment. What this membership includes is one monthly live Zoom call with me where I take you on a deep dive and a specific focus for the month. So think topics like self-love, self-confidence, and vitality. These topics are vital to living from your fullest potential in life. So these talks are going to support you to get more clarity on them and help you to develop and strengthen your relationship with them in your life. You get one monthly challenge that is specific to the focus for the month for stronger development and progress in that area. You get a monthly workbook with a summary of that topic and journal prompts around the subject. You get a variety of intentional meditations that I create to help you get rooted in specific areas of yourself and your life. You get exclusive Black Boat Beauty Radio podcast guest content for Queendom members only. And ladies, I love to have fun, so you can expect to have a lot of it in Queendom. There will be several pop-up virtual events, including more live coaching sessions with me, beauty sessions, training sessions, cooking hangs, master classes and Q&As, all with high-level guest experts. You also get my VIP high performance vault. So think my top tools that I rely on to feel my best, to look my best, and to perform my best in life. Above all, you get community and accountability support from the incredible members of Queendom who are on aligned missions to live from their fullest potential in life. You know, one of my favorite quotes that sums up my aim with Queendom is this one by Reid Hoffman. No matter how brilliant your mind or strategy, if you're playing a solo game, you will always lose out to a team. You guys, I want you all to be winning in your life from within and out. And I'm a firm believer that teamwork truly does make the dream work. So I've designed Queendom to be exactly that, a team of women who are supporting the best in each other to actualize their dreams into life. So the cost for all of this is just $40 a month. And that price is exclusive to this period of enrollment only. For those who purchase a full year of membership up front, you get one month of membership for free. Investing in this membership is investing in yourself. So if you're ready to join Queendom, go to blackbeltbeauty.com to sign up or click the link in the show notes. Ladies, let's seek the fight together in 2021 as a badass team of empowered queens. Membership has its privileges. I can't wait to see you and support you in the queendom. When you talk about context and something that came to my mind is... um, discipline versus self-discipline because that's something that you talk about in the book and I don't think a lot of people realize that there is an actual difference so can Mm -hmm. you talk about that a bit because it's so important yeah this is yeah I had to get vulnerable with myself to figure this one out because (laughs) (laughs) because uh I, 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 there felt like I was a difference and I, I had to ask myself why. And the reason why I figured it out is because I said you know I am when it comes to discipline which is which is kind of the the ability to achieve a, a a goal that is 
a little bit longer term and it, and and the the achievement of which is there the the external world has a say in other words there's other there's factors that are going to hit you right so yeah so it's going to take adaptability and flexibility and like and like moving and bobbing and weaving and and it's going to take grit you know if I, mm-hmm. I'm pretty good at that. I have been my whole life, right? I mean, mm-hmm. a kid from Connecticut who wasn't really a big athlete and I became a Navy SEAL, right? So I, mm-hmm. I, I know how to do that and I've done it a couple of times. I am horrible at self-discipline. I really am. I always have been. And so, but self-discipline is different. Self-discipline is, is are those things that you can do um, or even goals you want to achieve that are completely internal, that the external mm-hmm. world has no say. Okay, this is actually like getting in shape or yeah. eating well, okay? You know, you can you can decide to do that. Um, and then, you know, uh, two days in, you can be at the, at the buffet in Vegas, right? And it's up to, and the buffet is not going to throw the junk food at you. It's up to you whether or not you have this, the healthy stuff or the, or the pastries, right? So, so self-discipline involves goals and things that, uh, that are internally focused and the external world has no say. Mm-hmm. Overall discipline involves those things that the external world does have a say. The reason why there's a difference, and we all know people who are extraordinarily self-disciplined, Mm-hmm. But they can't seem to get their their long term goals. Off. I mean, they're just hard. They're just they're a mess when it comes yeah. to long term goals, right? But they're yeah. really self disciplined. And then right. there are other people we see who are extraordinarily unself disciplined, but their their right. overall long term discipline is phenomenal, right? Um, right. And the uh, and the reason why so the best is a balance of both, obviously. Yeah. Um, sometimes too much self discipline can actually impede your ability to be disciplined because too much self-discipline often requires um, certainty and predictability, right? Mm. A a routine, okay? And anybody who's achieved a long-term goal that the external world has a say on, whether it's the Navy SEAL, whether it's winning a contest, whether it's a singer, whatever, will know that it's always going to, the pathway is always going to change. You're going to have to, you're going to have to adapt. You're never going to, it's never going to be predictable. Right. And and so, so I always say when it comes to long-term discipline and the discipline I talk about in the book, always be resolute in your outcome, but be flexible in the approach. Okay. And and so, and, 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 and this is where rock climbers can teach us a lot. And of course, as you know, I don't like heights, so I don't climb rocks, but, (laughs) but the, (laughs) But the rock climber stands at the base of the of the cliff or the mountain and says, "Okay, top. That's where mm-hmm. I'm going." And then and then probably does a does a quick map out of, "Okay, here's how I think I'm going to move up this this face," and then begins to climb. And inevitably, during that climb, we'll recognize that as they look for the the best handholds and footholds, that that original path is not necessarily the path they're going to go on. They're going to have to they're going to have to kind of move and adjust. And and then sometimes they're going to in fact have to go like right and down. To find mm. the next best foothold, which means sometimes when we're when we're moving towards our goal, we're actually feel like we're moving away from it, you know, mm. because because we're trying to find the best foothold to get back up and we'll lose sight of the top sometimes, too. You have to actually be flexible and sometimes too much self-discipline, too much um, um, reliance on routine mm-hmm. uh, can can impede that ability to do that. So there's a there's a separation we have to we have to recognize. It's so, so powerful. I mean, especially the step down. I mean, people don't necessarily think of that, but that, you know, there's, I have a morning ritual. I get up, um, I read for a couple hours and I meditate, I journal and it's, and it's consistent. And then I get my movement in. Um, However, and this is where, you know, like I always say, Bruce Lee is like a soulmate to to me because I love his, uh, his ideas on, you know, don't, no systems, like don't, Mm don't get crystallized. And it's not to say that a routine isn't great. I am, I, I have routines. I am very self-disciplined and I love it, but let's just say as an example, to paint a picture, um, one morning I wake up and the urgency to want to move puts me, I'm not going to read as much, or I'm not going to even journal that day or whatever, but I'm responding to this feeling that I have inside and I'm going, okay. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that, oh no, my perfect morning ritual. And now I'm falling apart. And I, you don't <laughs> want to be rigid. You want yeah. that, you know, it's always, I always say like, I have these funny statements, but like, you can't snap a string. And so right. there's, right. And so there's yeah. so much power, but you wouldn't, most people aren't thinking like a string. That's not powerful, right? And, and well, this, this speaks <laughs> to another, this speaks to another attribute, which is adaptability. And this is where um, a lot of your audience, I know you, you hang with the fighter crowd, right? Yeah. Where I think, you know, there's I, so athletics holistically only give us a little bit of sense of the attributes because depending on the sport, sports are fairly predictable, right? If you have football, basketball field, I mean, there are boundaries and rules. There's there's yard lines. There's things you have to stay. So there's a lot of a lot of 
constraints and boundaries built within some of the some sports, okay? Which right. means it's fairly predictable and certain. But one sport that I think is phenomenal for adaptability is fighting, is, is, is combat fighting. And I, again, I don't fight really, you know, at all. I've got some training, but I'm not really a fighter. Um, yeah. But I know just in knowing fighters and observing that world, you know, you can have any plan you want as a fighter and you can train all the all the different skills and stuff. But once you begin the fight, you are highly adaptable. It's like it's like, I, OK, I plan A, B and C, but I, the, the person fighting me might do like G or F, right. <laughs> which means I have to change. Which means I have to change on the fly, and I think I think fighting, especially when you start getting into like the MMA and where you're just like, mm -hmm. it's like very few rules, and you could be on the ground. You could be. You're talking about um, a a level of a mental acuity training and b adaptability training and development that is really really high because you're you're having to read the environment every moment and adapt to what you're seeing in the fighting world. And I'm just, I'm saying this as someone who observes it, not really as someone who's done a lot of fighting, but I would imagine most of the people um, who fight would agree with that. Um, and I'd say from, from a athletic standpoint, those are really f uh, just fruitful training grounds for, for adaptability, um, uh, for resiliency you know, the grit attributes. I think, I don't know if they, they've done studies on, on what athletes make it through seal training the most and they couldn't, they, they couldn't find that that many sports they, in, the, in the early days they found that wrestlers did very well and this mm -hmm. was before i don't know if they've done any recent ones but wrestling is kind of that same thing i mean yeah. wrestlers are constantly having to adapt right so it's right. that and i think that's it just sets you up mentally well yeah no totally it's a, it's one of the most powerful tools in mma and and even if you think about weight cutting, the discipline and all that, that's a hardcore yeah. thing to do, right? So, yeah, I, right. Know, I love that. And it, I, I'm a jujitsu girl. I train Brazilian jujitsu. Um, I mean, that's one of the ways that I get, you know, I get to uh, develop this discomfort, like being comfortable in discomfort. Right. Because when right. you have, you know, a 200 pound guy on me, I mean, granted, the overall environment is safe and I know that, but it's still a combative sport. I've been yeah. injured, like things can happen, right? And um, learning how to be comfortable, to, to have a great relationship with my nervous system is how I put it, you know, to, to be, to find levels of comfort in discomfort um, is really powerful. And jujitsu is a pathway to, to, uh, for me to develop that MMA. I agree. I mean, one of the most, I think one of the, the greatest aspects of enjoying the sport is you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. It's like in the last two seconds, the whole shit can change. Like, the, yes. you know, yeah. which is and you, so, you get comfortable with that. So a good yeah. friend of mine, his name is Josh Waitskin. I don't know. Yeah. If you know oh, Josh. Yeah. He's a, yeah, he's brilliant. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, he's brilliant. So yeah. Josh and I were good friends and he and I would, uh, would, what before COVID we'd meet up in New York and have, uh, whenever I was there, we'd have breakfast or something and we'd chat. And I always loved talking to him and he, you know, obviously for the, for the audience who don't know him, he was a chess champion at the, you know, by the age of, I mean, national chess champion by the age of, no, world chess champion by the age of 16. And then after that, stopped playing chess and then became in three years, the uh, Tai Chi push hands champion, you know? Yeah. And, um, but anyway, he used to talk about his, his strategy for chess. And I remember asking him, I was like, what was your, and he talks about it in the book. I just wanted to hear him say it, but, <laughs> but yeah. he said, I said, what was your strategy? And he, he said, I, I became so good. And if you read the book, he wrote a book called art of learning, the art mm -hmm. of learning, a great book. If anybody wants to check so it good. out, he, but he talked about how he learned chess on the streets of New York with just these old guys who he used to play with. And it was a, it was a highly dynamic, unpredictable environment inside of, uh, inside of which you can play chess. Cause you just never knew what was going to happen. There was no structure to it. And he said that his strategy, he used to deliberately, when he used to be against opponent, he used to deliberately create chaos on the chessboard mm -hmm. because he knew. And, and, and in doing so, he didn't know if he was going to win. He didn't by, by creating chaos. He didn't know what the outcome would. He just knew he'd be more comfortable in chaos than his opponent. Right. And he and he and he took that to some of his fighting techniques, too. Right. He started he just knew how to let's just create chaos because I know at the end of the day, I'm more comfortable in chaos than this guy is um, or gal. Um, and that's incredible. I mean, it's a really so you talk about true confidence, you know, true yeah. confidence. I think true confidence actually stems from one's ability to understand that regardless of how the environment goes, you'll you'll figure it out. You know, and I think mm -hmm. people ask you what you get from SEAL training. I think that's what you get from SEAL training. You come out of SEAL training with with true confidence because you come out understanding, hey, I just went through something that was really incredibly difficult um, and I'm here and I performed through it. And then as you hyper develop that through a career, you just have the sense, hey, when the environment you know deteriorates, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to perform. You know, I always say my you know, I'm, I live here in Virginia in my neighborhood. I have three other seals who live right on my street. OK, mm -hmm. I have one across the street. I have one down the down the road to the left, one down the road to the right. And then, 
And I remember my wife saying, she said, I, I'm so glad these guys are here because if anything ever happened and I needed help, I could go to them and they'd act like you act. And I, and I said, what, what do you mean by that? I said, well, if I went to them and, and something was going on, they'd immediately calm down and they'd start working the problem, <laughs> right? Because yeah. that's, that's what you develop in the SEAL teams. You, you develop this ability to just start if something, if the shit starts you know, raining, right? You're just like, okay, calm down work the problem. What can I, and, and that's, a, that's true confidence. I think at the end of the day, oh, God, you're speaking to my heart. I mean, this is stuff I talk about all the time and in, in every channel of mine, but I love writing about this. I'm a lifelong writer. Um, you know, I talk about, um, just composure, equanimity, um, you know, and I actually, it makes me think about confidence versus self-confidence. If there's a difference, mm-hmm. um, I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. And then also, you know, you, when you like what you just described so beautifully, how I, I always say like true self-confidence, because we know that there's a lot of like pseudo confidence and, and how yeah. that is developed is this like external validation, you know, people feeling like, oh, this is who I am because this is what you're saying, who I am. And that, you know, but to me, it's, it's so in alignment with what you just said, true self-confidence. I just say self-confidence it has to come from the witnessing and the knowing that you persevere, you Mm -hmm. have pushed through, you've done hard shit, you've faced fear and challenges and all those things. And you, and you got up and you, and you, maybe you won or you just survived, but surviving is, is winning too, right? In those situations. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It's so, it's so powerful. What do you think about that though? Like self-confidence versus confidence. Um, Do you think that there's a difference? I love that you brought this up because I've never thought about it. And I'm so glad you did because I love semantics. Me (laughs) too. I love breaking down. So yeah. So let's talk about this because as you're yeah. as you're saying it, I'm thinking, and I think you're right. I think self confidence is what we're talking about. I think confidence, perhaps, look, I'll just throw this out there. Maybe perhaps confidence has to do with skills. Okay, I'm confident I can drive a car. If I were to tell you I'm self confident I can drive a car, that would sound weird, right? So, right. so confidence might deal with might might speak to skills. I'm confident I can do this or do that skill. Self confidence perhaps speaks to your ability just to, to, to be and perform in environments, you know? Um, so, so both are good and both are necessary, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you, you need uh, to, to actually, in fact, have some self-confidence in life. You need to be confident in certain skills, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think there is a difference. And I think it's a remarkable one. And I think we should strive for both. I think ultimately though, if, if you want to lean on self-confidence will probably be harder to develop, you know, mm-hmm. because it's, it has to do with your ability to, to operate in certainty. And then of course, just make sure that whatever it is, doesn't bleed into arrogance, you know, because there's a difference there too, obviously, you know, confidence is, is internally focused and it's, I can do this. Whereas arrogance is externally expressed as I'm better than you. Um, and that's not what the master thinks, right? The master mm-hmm. thinks I'm confident, but I can always learn. Um, so you just have, we have to be careful about not, bleeding over into arrogance. Oh, it's so good. That's so good. Wait, you said something in there too that I got to pick on because it's it's something that I want to talk about. You said certainty. I heard certainty. And yeah. a question that I, I really wanted to present to you is when you hear the word uncertainty, what do you think about? Opportunity. <laughs> 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 um, because it's, because it's unknown, right? I mean, it's uh, that's discovery, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I think, um, you know, I mean, uncertainty is potential, you know, uncertainty is, is discovery. Uncertainty is exploration. Um, certainly there's bad connotations of uncertainty, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't empower us. It doesn't do us much good to, th- to think about the bad connotations. Um, uncertainty is life. You know, it really is because we are not, you know, this world is inherently unpredictable. Mm-hmm. Um, even though we have laws of nature and things that we've pretty our science is helping us put more predictability around, around the universe. Sure. Um, but ultimately, even science, science is the first is the first genre to say we still don't know. I mean, we don't know what right. we don't know. We're starting to discover right? nothing's certain. You know, it's all. So I think um, I think that's where I am fascinated with potential, just like you are. And potential is what could be and what could be is uncertain, you know, and that's why I like uncertainty. Oh, it's so good. When it, so one of my favorite words, I don't know if you ever heard of it. Um, I did not invent it, but I always say like, I'm a possibilitarian because <laughs> it's so yeah. good. You know, when you think about, um, you know, what if, right? Uncertainty's favorite question. And this goes back to like neurobiology, right? So you can look at what if 
from a very fear-based mentality. Mm -hmm. What if, I don't know, I don't know, all the fear starts kicking in, but you can look at that same question. So I'm into semantics too, obviously. And you can look at it with excitement because there's possibility, there's discovery on the other end. And it's crazy how just that different lens of looking at it from the, what if I don't know, and that fear-based mentality versus the possibility being a possibilitarian yeah. is going to literally neuro from a neurobiology perspective, like shape change how you move towards uncertainty. Right. Oh yeah. 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 This is, it, this is, the, this is, I think what separates us and we don't know, again, it separates us from every other species. And again, I, we admit, we don't know. There's some species that we, we but as, as in so far as we know, humans are the only ones who can actually, um, envision and think about that which does not exist okay mm-hmm. um and so and in doing so that implies this what if right but but this is this is where um our natural curiosity begins to work together because there are the there are the what if people and then there are how the how people and so the what if people might be the creatives who say hey what if and then the scientists say okay cool how right <laughs> both those questions are empowering questions and both move us forward you know yeah um and i think that you know it's the it's the mindsets that really i try to stay away from um that have stopped asking that you know because mm-hmm. again as human beings we're also um we also love certainty <laughs> we we want to but which which also begs which makes us say the word question how and why you know because we're always trying to figure out in our environment um because we want to be certain about it but the the the, the downside of that is sometimes we make up things and make up stories that explain things <laughs> to, we make up stories to explain things that have, that have no basis in, in reality, but we, right. we hang our hat on them anyway, which is totally. tough. Right. So, right. so I think that open-mindedness, that, that, that kind of possibilitarian is, yeah. <laughs> it's so is, is so important, right? Possibilitarian. It yeah. is, you know, one of my favorite, favorite quotes that I would love for you to elaborate on, cause I think it's so valuable and to insert it into this amazing conversation is control the controllables. Yeah. Um, can you talk about that? Because I feel like that is, I mean, it's something that I, I like to, uh, talk about with, with my community because I think there's so much value in it, but I want you to explain it. You could do it a lot better than me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, so, so let me just quickly, I have to, I, I quickly to do that. I have to quickly just describe what fear is. Okay. Fear <laughs> is a combination of anxiety plus uncertainty, okay? Mm-hmm. And when you combine the two, you get great fear. You don't, you can have one without the other and you don't have fear show up, right? You can be anxious without being uncertain. That's like, hey, I'm nervous for the presentation that's coming up. I know where it's gonna be. I know what it is. I know the crowd. I'm just a little nervous, right? That's anxiety without uncertainty. You can be uncertain without being anxious, okay? That's every kid on Christmas Eve, all right? Mm-hmm. When you start to combine the two, that's when fear starts to show up, right? The way you can manage your fear, in other words, in other words, keep that amygdala hijack from happening and keep your frontal lobe online is to buy down either one of those two um, components. Okay. Now, yeah. if you can, if if you want to get conscious thinking first, you should you should do you should buy down anxiety first. We we can do that by managing your physiology. It's all and anxiety is all internal, right? So you can do that by breathing techniques, visual techniques, things like that that Huberman talks about all the time. But things that help calm you and shift you from sympathetic to parasympathetic. That's how you do anxiety. Then you can say, I'm going to buy down uncertainty. Now, the only way you can do that, because the uncertain world is external and you can't really control it, is to begin asking yourself some questions, okay, about that environment. What about this do I understand? And from that, what can I control? This is what it means to control the controllables. In the SEALs, there's a saying called control your three-foot world, right? So the other, the other words, out of, that, out of the stuff I understand, what can I control right now? What can I, what can I move to in this moment? As soon as you decide to do that, this is, by the way, how you step through uncertainty, challenge, and stress. Um, as soon as you decide to make that movement, you are hit with a dopamine reward. And you, you make that, I shouldn't say, you decide and you make that movement, you're hit with a dopamine reward, mm-hmm. which allows you to pull back out and ask the question again. Mm-hmm. And you say, okay, now what can I control? Okay, you do that. Now what can I control? And that, the, the, the extent to which you, you move that lens, right, or that horizon is up to you, right? That could be, I'm waiting. It could be you're in hell. You're in hell week. I said, I'm just going to make it to the next meal. Or it could be you're in hell week and you're, I was like, I'm just going to go the next 10 steps. Okay. Yeah. Whatever that is, as long as it has meaning to you, you just created a, 
you just you just took control of an uncontrolled of, of an uncertain environment, which yeah. is what humans like. You've rewarded yourself neurologically and neurophysiologically or, uh, with a neurotransmitter, and mm-hmm. then allowed yourself to do it again. And so, controlling the controllables is a strategy for moving through uncertainty, challenge, and stress. You just have to be able to cognitively ask those questions: What are what can I control in this moment, and just decide to move to that. It's so powerful. And it just makes me think it's like you are essentially like you're kind of slowing things down too, yeah. right? Because when you're feeling nervous, anxious, or fear, things kind of, you're moving faster. You're not present, right? I mean, right, literally right. anxious, you're like, so control the controllable is like brings you into the present moment, get into your body, work that nervous system um, to get into the uh, parasympathetic state. And then And then, you know, think about like everything you just said. I love that. I think that's so valuable because I mean, listen, you know, last year was like one of the greatest examples of people, you know, (laughs) dealing with uncertainty, you know, Um, you know, I always say like prior to my, by launching my brand and and podcasts and coaching business, you know, I worked as a freelance artist and I'm like, (laughs) Listen, people, 2020, I have lived uncertainty like as a norm, you know, right. like, week by week, you don't know what's next. And it's, it's, and it really did help me though. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Because when you, I mean, when you're thinking about like livelihood as a flip freelance artist and you don't know what's coming next, you're just kind of living on hope and your belief and, and doing what is necessary to keep driving forward. And I got to the top 1% of my career for a reason. Yeah. Um, you know, I had to endure a lot of uncertainty as a constant. Yeah. So when 2020 hit, for sure, it was different. You know, it's a different stimulus. But but yet the uncertainty aspect was not unfamiliar to me. Well, and, and so. it's a great example of why you were able to read the book, for example, and start to start to say, oh, OK, this makes sense to me because you've already had you have so many environments inside of which you were able to see those attributes on display, yeah. which is, so I would offer anybody who doesn't maybe have that portfolio <laughs> of uncertainty <laughs> that you do, um, but we all have a common one, which is 2020, okay? So right. so we all have an ability, we all have this, I guess, gift mm-hmm. of this year that was so horrific in so many different ways that yeah. we can look back and say, okay, wait, how did I perform? You know, what showed up and what didn't? And you can use that. You know, in fact, we can use all of our, I call them, I call them antagonists, the antagonists of life, right? Because antagonists can be anything, you know, in, in the theatrical de- definition, a protagonist is the person, place, or thing that is for the main idea. And the antagonist is the person, place, or thing that is against the main idea. Well, well, we all have antagonists, whether it's an actual person, whether it's an event, whether it's an illness, a divorce, or a, a layoff, whatever. We all have antagonists. And to effectively autopsy our antagonists, we can look back and say, okay, how did I perform? What did I learn? How did I grow? This, by the way, is also the secret to resilience and anti fragility. Is if you can effectively and 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 um, uh, objectively mm-hmm. look back at an event, you know, again, you have to try to have most emotion gone because if you're still emotional about it, it's not going to work properly. But if you can if you can get most emotion gone from it and look back and reflect effectively, you will, in essence, grow from that. Uh, from that antagonist, you know, and, um, and you will also learn something about yourself. Oh, wait a second. Yeah, I'm not that adaptable. Okay, so I got to note that I got to note that when the environment changes around me, it's going to be painful. All right, got it. Again, no judgment, just know it's gonna be a little bit tough. And I might want to develop that. Even if I don't develop it, you know, just know it's gonna be tough. (laughs) Right. So so that knowledge is powerful, right? It's so powerful. Yeah. Last year and, you know, parts of some of my podcasts, some episodes I do with solo sodes. um, You know, I talk about for me, you know, it's always, it's not just about like getting to the goal, moving through the challenge. It's about who am I between this space? Like, who am I? And I'm very aware and I'm always watching, like, you know, I, to me, composure is very sexy. Like it just is. And it doesn't mean that there's always like, you know, tons of composure. I mean, every challenge is going to, it's a different stimulus. It's going to, you know, like it makes me think of dormant attributes, right? Something that you talk yeah, about yeah, yeah. in right, the, yeah. and I'd love to touch on that, but it's like you, you know, for me, I, I want to hold my shit together as much as possible. <laughs> like there's no better way to say it. You know, Roxy, because- it's funny though. I, I, I'd love to see the person who thinks panic is sexy. That'd be yeah. funny to <laughs> So anyway, I just. <laughs> Plot twist. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, no, like, listen, I have a, I have a, I have a relationship with my future self. Um, she's a badass. And one of the greatest things about her, I converse with her in meditation every day. 
This woman is so stoic, which doesn't mean she's a robot. She doesn't feel, it doesn't mean that she can't, she doesn't bleed. She doesn't sweat. No, 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 she does. It's just the ability to carry a load that is heavy Mm -hmm. with grace, you know, with, and and ultimately with confidence, right? That no, I got, I got this. So I, well, I think, I think you're, you're probably already there. You're already a badass. So know that you're (laughs) you're already a version of your future self. Uh, But, uh, but yeah, I think you're right. The master always has room to grow. Always has room to grow. It's like, I never want to catch her. (laughs) And really it's, um, I think the, 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 the most powerful people in terms of their ability to control are the ones who understand the power of emotions to the extent that they can use them to their advantage. Because, Mm -hmm. because, and and so in the, in the best cases, right, you know, um, um, joy and exuberance is, is very uh, uplifting and it creates DHEA in our system and rebuilds, right? So it's a rebuilding tool. So if you can, if you can deliberately implement joy and, 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 um, and exuberance into your, into your body, you'll grow, right? Um, Anger and frustration is 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 meant to get us moving. It's meant to get us uh, frustration and agitation by design in our systems to get us to do something. When we're hungry, we get agitated to make us go find food, or when we're lonely and depressed, agitated to go find uh, companionship. So so focused, you know, anger and frustration can actually get us moving yeah. towards something positive. Um, same thing with sadness, you know, and and the, the kind of the the more. The, the more slightly morbid example would be, you know, when you're in combat, you see stuff that's tough sometimes, and you don't oftentimes in the moment have tough to uh, have time to mourn that. Um, yeah. So you, you have to compartmentalize that, compartmentalize and just finish the job. You have to complete the mission, which is exactly what has to happen. If you can't, however, later on, mm-hmm. uh, choose to deliberately mourn, right, mm-hmm. and let that out. Um, it's going to it's going to build up, and we're going to get you know get PTSD and things like that. And so and so the folks that I know, and I, luckily I was able to do this, that were able to see something and and experience something, and then take time later to deliberately mourn it and exude those emotions. You're you're it, it was healthy. It's healthier that way. So so, so that understanding of emotional power. I mean, their emotions are there for a reason, right? And so we just have to understand when they come in. Is it you know, they can be fuel. They can be really, they can be rocket fuel towards, towards something, you know? So we just have to understand how to use them. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's so powerful. No, I love that. I always, yeah, they're there for a reason. I always say like, you know, feel it, learn from it, ask questions, like just discover more of yourself in the emotion. Just don't become it. Right. Right. You can feel frustrated, but don't become a frustrated human. (laughs) That's not sexy. Yeah. Don't, don't live it. Don't live it. (laughs) Don't live it. Exactly. Um, just because we touched on it, um, the dormant attributes, can you, yeah, yeah, I think that was so. So dormant attributes are just those attributes that we have a preponderance of, but we don't know it. And the the reason why we don't know it is we've never been put into a situation or experience that's drawn that out, you know? Um, and this, you know, so I kind of, I think I described in the book, like the Scrooge effect, like Ebenezer Scrooge, who is the, um, who is the uh, grumpy old miser after a night of haunting is suddenly the empathetic kind human being. Well, th- th- he didn't, he didn't turn that way overnight. He was that way. It's just the, the experience allowed that to be brought out. Um, I would, I would imagine if anybody wants to think about dormant attributes, uh, think about any store in your life that ends with the, that can end with the phrase, I didn't know I had it in me. And it's mm-hmm. probably a story about a, a dormant attribute coming to the fore that you didn't know you had. Um, uh, but we do have dormant attributes. This is a this is this is one of the reasons why you should seek the fight. You know, this is one of your brilliant you know brilliant ideas. Um, if you if you choose to seek the fight, you're choosing to put yourself into some discomfort, some uncertainty, and you're going to tease out attributes that you didn't know you, you you might not know you had, and you'll learn something about yourself, which is cool. So good. That's so powerful. Thank you. Um, question when you, out of all the attributes, I mean, I'm sure the entire process of writing the book was making you think, um, but what would you say, could you point out one or two attributes that really had you thinking deeper about them, maybe in a way that you never had before? Well, certainly, um, discipline, I had to do some self some thinking. <laughs> I think, right. I think the other, the other big one, the, the, the one that we probably shouldn't leave unsaid would be narcissism. Yes. Um, <laughs> because, uh, because I was really, um, trying to figure out, uh, why that made sense to me. Um, and, and I, and there are a couple things. First of all, um, I, the definition of narcissism is the desire to stand out, be adored, be loved, you know, be recognized. Right. Um, and of course, there's narcissistic personality disorder, which is a very bad thing, and it's it's bad for everybody and, and should be avoided. But when you look at the DSM-5, which is the psychological kind of Bible, and you look at the explanation of, of 
narcissistic personality disorder, there are like nine criteria. Um, there's you know, kind of, you know, beefed up sentences. If you, and if you mm-hmm. have five or more, you technically have the disorder. Okay. Kind of rare. It's actually to, to have the full blown disorder is actually rare in the population. But, um, I looked at those, those nine things and I said to myself, okay, well, I don't, I certainly don't have five or more. Right. But there's elements of some of these sentences that resonate with me. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, um, <laughs> And then I said to myself, okay, well, let me think about why I became a Navy SEAL in the first place. Okay. I was a young, I was 22 years old and I was a patriot. I wanted to do, I wanted to, you know, serve my country. But ultimately, if I were being honest with myself, I wanted to see if I could be a badass. I wanted to see if I could do something that very few people could do. And when I started talking to my buddies, you know, they, they would admit the same thing. Yeah. I just, you know, come on, it's kind of badass, right? Yeah. That's a little bit of narcissism speaking. What we have to recognize is as human beings that we um, all, every single human being at some point in their lives wants to stand out, be adored, be recognized. And this is biological. When we are getting paid attention to um, by our parents, for example, as an infant, we are getting bursts of two neurotransmitters and one hormone, right? Uh, oxy- uh, uh, dopamine, which we all know, serotonin, which is kind of a, a neurotransmitter feeling of safety and, and connection and things like that. Um, and then oxytocin, which is known as the love hormone. Okay. We're getting all three of those when we're getting paid attention to and adored as babies. Okay. That doesn't change when we're adults. Okay. Right. It's, it's nice. It's nice to sometimes be, be adored and get paid attention to feel special, to stand out, yeah. um, to be unique. Okay. Um, this is the, this, what I realize is, is in some cases, the impetus of audacious calls. This is the kid who wants to be the rock star. This is the kid who wants to be the Navy SEAL. This is the kid who wants to be the, the surgeon or the astronaut or, or the best, um, salesperson, you know, whatever it is, it doesn't matter the goal. If it means something to you, you want a part of the reason why you make those audacious calls is narcissism. So the key is Let's let's recognize our humanness. Let's recognize that narcissism exists. Let's use it effectively and metabolize it effectively. And then make sure we understand the caveat. The, the, it comes with a huge warning label, right? Because if it gets over, if it gets, if you get too much, right? Mm-hmm. The problem with it is it's invisible to see in ourselves. It's like it's like a vampire staring in the mirror. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's impossible to see in ourselves, which means the inoculation of for that is to surround yourself with people who give you who love you and know you and give you the honest candor with care that you need. They tell you when you're getting out over, over your skis, they tell you when your head's getting, getting too big. This is your grounding wires. You're, you know, my wife's been a grounding wire for me since we married. Right. And my teammates were the same thing, but, but people who love you enough to keep you in check, mm-hmm. you can tell the narcissists um, by the people they surround themselves with narcissists, the full blown ones surround oh. themselves with sycophants. You know, they surround themselves with people who are always making them the center of tension. Sure. They get, they get really, they despise when they're not the center of attention. Um, if someone leaves their group, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it goes off, that person is now public enemy number one, right? Because mm. that person is no longer giving them attention. So, so you can, you can certainly, it's, it's pretty easy to see narcissists you know, yeah. on the outside, but in terms of ourselves, if we're, if we're careful, we just have to look at the people we're surrounding ourselves. If we're, if we're surrounding ourselves with people who are yes, yes men, exactly. you know, and, and it's kind of like, you know, we're always the center and everybody's kind of always in deference to it. We're, we may have a problem, you know, totally. um, you, you want to, that's what, this is where good friends come from. It's like mm-hmm. people who, you're not always the center of attention. You're, you're not always the focus. You're, you know, that's, that's, that's healthiness, but certainly a little bit of narcissism can actually be an incredible driver. So use it. Use it oh, wisely. So powerful. You know, one thing that bores me is blanket statements and I feel <laughs> <laughs> like straight up. Um, I'm like lazy. That's a blanket thinking. statement, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> really? I never heard it. It's just like lazy thinking and blanket statements. And they really yeah, yeah. go hand in hand. And I, you know, you see, I mean, Instagram, it's like, there's all this stuff on narcissism and then you get to your book and it's like, oh, well, actually, I mean, has anybody even thought of it this way? And you know what I wanted to talk to you about? Um, I've never thought of it as narcissism, but I, and I haven't taken deep dives into conversations on the ego, but it's kind of, it, it runs parallel. Well, I, I have thought of, you know, the ego, I always say it like this, like, have a healthy relationship with your ego. If we didn't have ego, we wouldn't have gone to the moon or done incredible things. But now I'm thinking about it from that perspective of having a healthy, you know, level of narcissism that is driving you to do incredible things in life. Yeah. To to make those audacious goals. Yeah. Yeah. So that's so great. Okay. Mindful of your time. Um, a couple things I want to ask you. 
the attributes that you leaned into to write the book. Um, yes. Can you highlight a couple? Because I I'm planning just so you know to write a couple of books in my life, you know? Yeah, so yeah. I'm curious to what attributes you really leaned into hard. Cause I know it's, it's a, yeah. not an easy Well, self- self-efficacy certainly. Um, mm-hmm. So you have to have the confidence to, to, to understand you could do and get started. Um, open-mindedness in terms of understanding what you where you think the book is supposed to go. It's probably going to change as you go. So that, that in, in, in invokes adaptability as well, which is actually part of the fun of the process. Um, humility. Uh, you want to have other people, read it and absorb it and tell you, Hey, this is not making sense. And you're going to have to get rid of some of the things that you really love. You're like, well, no, that's great. No, it shouldn't be in here. Right. So, so I think those are probably some starter, starter attributes for, for any type of writing endeavor. Okay. Amazing. Noted. Another question. Um, you know, I, when I was younger, my discipline, self-discipline, let me frame it to you like this. When I was a teenager, cleaning my room meant shoving all the shit in my closet and under the bed. Mm -hmm. My environments now, they're mint because I need them to be, because I'm an artist and I like client, like, so like everything needs to be clean. You know, when I cook, I leave the kitchen and it's cleaner than when I went in there, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so thinking about that, I'm like, I've obviously developed these attributes that support that. Like, I would say it's self-discipline. Um, I don't know if you would agree on that, but just thinking about your life and some of the attributes that you have developed, um, you know, throughout your life that are really serving you. Can you point out a few of them that you had lower, yeah. ver- you know, levels of at a younger age yeah, versus yeah. now? I, the one that comes to mind immediately is empathy. And I, I, I was never, I was never unempathetic. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know, but, but I know that, you know, especially in, I guess, in my profession, I didn't have a lot of empathy. I didn't really, I wasn't concerned with it. It was really when I met my wife, who's one of the most empathetic people on the planet, who really started to teach me that there's, there's, there's value in every human being. You can learn something from everybody. Um, and I just used to see how she, her natural curiosity used to just tr- bring people, bring things out of people. I'm like, oh my God, I would have never known that. And so, and so it helped me start to really more actively try to put myself in other people's shoes. So I think I've, that's one that I've just developed over time more and more. And I continue to, because I think it's important, you know, especially in today's environment where we really have to try to be empathetic to as many people as we can. Yeah, no, it's a powerful one. So important. I love that. Um, Okay. Let me ask you this question um, before we move into something that I like to do with all my guests to to, uh, wrap out our, our conversation. Is there anything that you haven't mentioned in this conversation yet, or something that you maybe wish people would ask you more of that you'd like to speak on more of uh, that you feel would be really great to insert into this conversation. Gosh, no. it's been such a great conversation. To yeah. be with you. Um, I don't think so. I mean, I, I love just going with the flow. So, so, so far I mean, so good. That's what I'll say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. So one of my questions that I love to ask all my amazing guests, if you had a magic wand and you can give the masses one positive habit that would have a large ripple effect on their life, what would it be and why? Um, it, it would be the ability to ask better questions. And I talk about this all the time. Again, neurologically, we're designed to answer questions. If we deliberately place a question into our conscious mind, our brain begins to answer it, whether we like it or not. Mm. The problem is we do this unconsciously and the wrong way. Most of the time we say, why am I so bad at this? Why does this always happen to me? Why are these people out to get me? Right. And, and I learned when I was kind of in high school that if I took charge of my questions, and ask better ones, it would change the, it would change my life, right? Which it did. You know, I am, I am a believer that um, the quality of our lives is directly proportional to the quality of questions we consistently ask ourselves. And so, so take control of your questions and ask yourselves better ones. Uh, You can do that like now. I mean, that's something you do right away and you'll feel the difference. I love that. Do you journal? I don't, I don't, I should, but I, I'm always, I'm the person who's like, Hey, I should journal. And I don't, that's self-discipline. I don't have none. Right. But yeah. So instead I, but that's why writing the book was so good. I got a bunch of ideas out. I was like, okay, cool. 200 yeah. pages of ideas and I don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> so what is the greatest thing you've learned about yourself? I just thought of this and I have to ask you, uh, what's the greatest thing you learned about yourself in the process of writing your incredible book? Um, I learned that I get creative when I'm writing. Writing actually actually makes me more creative, which is fun. I actually get into flow states while I'm writing, um, and and that's always fun. To, I have to have like p- p- pads of paper near 
where I'm typing. Cause if I have an idea pop in, I have to write it down so I don't lose, lose it. Well, um, so yeah. So the process of creating makes me more creative. I love that. So then that bridges one other question. These are very just coming to me. What's next for you? Cause I know I can, I know you're yeah. someone who's looking forward, like what's next for you? Yeah. Well, I am. I love to write another book. I have some ideas on another one. Um, but I want right now we're building this, this attributes business, right? I mean, the mm-hmm. book's only three months old right now. Yeah. This day. So, so building the speaking, the speaking and consulting side of the business, hopefully get that to a place where yeah, I'd love to do, I'd love to do more in-depth um, uh, assessments, you know, that, mm-hmm. you know, see, see how, how we can take those. So really build that out over the next year or two and then see, if, um, and then, you know, see what, see what comes down the pike. I'll be adaptable. And, and, um, and there's some uncertainty out there, which is cool. So, yeah, I love that. So good. Okay. So you're going to, I feel like this will humor you a bit. So the last part of my, uh, conversations, I do this thing called rapid fire words. You do not need to be rapid in your response. It's whatever comes top of mind, top of heart. But what's funny is some of these words are going to really tell you like, oh, she really did love the book. (laughs) Um, Okay. First word. Ready? Yes. Love. My wife. Fear. Conquer. Courage. Fear. (laughs) Passion. Um, life, curiosity, everything, <laughs> um, uh, sorry, what was, it? no, where did I go? I just short circuited, um, challenge, uh, uh, good. <laughs> I feel like we're on a, like Jeopardy right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what is good? Sorry. <laughs> it's amazing. Or <laughs> family feud. Um, I'm from the eighties, obviously. Yeah. Um, two more words. One of my favorites, resilience. Anti-fragility. I love it. Final word, excellence. Um, excellence. Well-being. Mm, I love it. I love you passed. <laughs> oh, good. good yeah. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I lo- <laughs> oh my gosh. I am so grateful for every minute of this conversation, for you taking on the arduous task of writing your incredible book. I cannot say it enough. I love your book. It is something that I will continuously be using in my coaching practice, gifting to the world. And I just, I want to encourage everybody to go get your book, The Attributes, 25 hidden drivers to optimal performance. And I remember mm-hmm. it perfectly, yeah. uh, you know, just a fun little side note. So I get a lot of my books on Kindle first. And a lot of times too, cause I'll be reading books that maybe the pod, uh, I'm going to be podcasting with the guest, um, which I didn't know until with you in your case, until I was halfway through the book. And then I asked you to podcast. So what I do with my books on Kindle is I can highlight things and make them flashcards. Your oh. entire fucking book is a flashcard. <laughs> <laughs> Because then it's like retention, retention, and things I want to remember. And yeah. then if I have a lot of flashcards, then I buy the physical book because it sits in my library of life, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so, yeah, your book is in the library of life. Um, thank you so much, Rich. I, I hope to have more conversations, and I'm I'm here in full support of all of your work and everything that's coming from you. So thank you for being such a powerful contributor and all the work serving before all of it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks for being such a great supporter. Thanks for what you do. And let's definitely keep in touch. So absolutely. And everybody to stay in touch with you, Instagram, our best, what you know. Yeah. Yeah. The attributes.com on the, the attributes.com on the, on the, on the, uh, the web, you can go there, you can get the book, you can do the assessment. You can, you can hit me from there on Instagram and LinkedIn and the Facebook page, um, everything all there. So take a visit and be great. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Talk to you you again. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode, you guys. If you loved it, please share it on your social. Throw it up on your Instagram stories and tag me. I'm at Black Belt Beauty. I am also at Roxy Look. R-O-X-Y-L-O-O-K. I love connecting with you guys. This is a conversation that I want to just continue growing with you guys. So if you feel inspired, 
to hit me up, do so in that space. I always enjoy hearing from you. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by rating it and reviewing it via iTunes. It's such supportive help, you guys. It really helps the visibility of this podcast. So I appreciate and thank you in advance for doing that. And last but not least, if you are interested in starting your own podcast, or perhaps you already have one and you need help with you know editing your audio and the production of it, I cannot recommend my producers enough. Resonate Recordings, you guys, they are the bomb. I rely on them. They are an absolute supportive tool to me and my podcast. So check them out and let them know that Black Belt Beauty sent you. And on that note, you guys, I'm signing off with all my love and always looking forward to catching you on the next. Oh, 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 oh,